This is Talking in Stations. It is season three, episode number six. My name is Artemis Albosa, a member of Pandemic Horde. Joining me as always today, we have Silver Suspiria, a member of Federation Uprising. Hello, everyone. Joining us on the day, or today, on the show, temporarily at least, we have Matterall from Northern Coalition. How's it going, Artemis? It's going well, and I, I need to correct myself. It is Northern Coalition dot. The dot is very important. Moving on, we also have another member of our crew, Exxon Fang, a member of Free Range Chickens, otherwise known as Fwedit. Hey guys, how's it going? Glad to be on the show today. Another member of Fwedit on the show, we have Nivlak Hita, or Haita, however you pronounce your name. Let's go with Hita. Hi guys. And we may be getting on the show a bit later, so we'll introduce them when they arrive another guest. But we'll let you know if that happens. Let's, let's jump right into things and talk about why Matterall is on the show right now, at least in a, in a temporary capacity. Although you can feel free to stick around and join the conversation. So, Matterall, you have been very busy over the last, like, week, week and a half. And very stressed out, and also very excited, and the rest of the crew has been very excited. Why is that? <laughs> well, we had uh, an opportunity to interview for the second time uh, since March, Hilmar, the CEO of CCP. And uh, we also brought along or asked uh, Falcon to join him, as well as the brand manager for EVE Online, CCP Goodfella, who I'd met for the first time. And so we had to like do the scheduling and there's a lot of communication back and forth. And we ended up, uh, instead of doing a live show on Sunday, which we normally do, we decided to pre-record this interview and uh, publish it on Sunday uh, with a live audience and with a live Q&A handled by Carneros afterwards. So getting all that together was, uh, there was a lot of excitement being generated um, because uh, we could just feel that this was going to be a significant interview and boy, did it not let us down. It was amazing. I think everybody came out uh, really energized uh, after listening to Hilmar and uh, Falcon and our guys too, were doing a great job of uh, asking the right questions and, you know, trying to break through to the deeper levels of what these guys have to offer because when you when you talk to ccp it can be very much about what's happening today it could be very much about mechanics it could be about all the things that people want to fix the little things that work in their gameplay that they want to fix and talk about but that's not what this was this was a very high level showcase of incredible passion for eve online uh totally coupled with the intelligence of of what it takes to build a game as complicated as EVE Online. And like, I want to clarify things. So we've, we've had a bit of a discussion in crew about hyping up this interview because it is an incredible opportunity to be able to interview CCP. And so we want to make sure that like what they have to say gets out there and we want people to listen. But I, having listened to this interview, I don't think it is possible to overhype what has been said in this interview. Like. The amount of stuff that happens, the way that you get to hear the way that Hilmar and Goodfella and Falcon think, especially in the context of Falcon's rant on Reddit, for anybody who's seen that, like, it is just amazing. I am super excited to see the way that everyone reacts to what is said in this thing. Yeah, I think it's going to blow a lot of people away. When I uh, when we were doing it, it was, you can see the genuine uh exchange happening right we all felt good about that but after it was over and there was some funny things before and after that uh we could treat people to uh, a little behind the scenes uh, in a minute but when we were doing it it felt great but after we did it it was kind of an afterglow of like wow that really happened that way did they really say what they thought what i thought they said and um Going back and listening to it a second time, I was like, yeah, this is big. This is maybe one of the biggest interviews we've ever done. All right, so we, we have the big interview to listen, to look forward to on Sunday at 1600 UTC. But what is this, what's this, this preview, this uh, behind the scenes stuff you have to share with us? <laughs> well, there was some things. Uh, 
one of the fr- funny things that happened was as, as soon as Hilmar showed up, first of all, he showed up early and he, he comes in and he just, boom, starts talking. And we're like, well, but we're just not ready yet. So we start, we're still setting up, but he's talking like, you know, he's among uh, friends and peers. So we just, he's, we're letting him go. And he said something, uh, and we won't comment on what it was, but it was clearly a change that's coming to, to Eve online. And, uh, and he's like, well, I brought Goodfella here to keep me from screwing the pooch. That's what he's here for. So after a minute of consultation, um, he, Hilmar was going to make an announcement on the show, but instead he just said, oh, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll just say that there is an announcement that's going to be made rather than give the announcement on the show. But um, uh, he showed us some he showed us some stuff as well. I guess I can't even say what it was, but he was just, he's just super excited about it. So that was pretty funny. But at the end of the show, after everybody was cooling down, uh, Hilmar can be heard saying like, whew, that was, that was long. And it was, it was two and a half hours that he was with us. Two hours were recorded. But uh, at the at the end, I asked him about, uh, I said, um, hey, Hilmar, I didn't get to this question, but what do you think of all the offshore that's going on in high sec? And he was literally drinking his coffee and just exploded <laughs> all over his mic. Uh, his coffee just went shooting out of his mouth as he started coughing. Um, and then he lay, and then and then he talked about it. Um, I guess I, I won't say what he said about it, but it was really interesting uh, what he had to say about it. But his reaction was just hilarious. Yeah, I mean. I- what an incredible opportunity and, and rare for like a CEO of a company like that to spend two hours, you know, doing community stuff like that and having a great time and being so open like that. Um, really great work there. Yeah, and he's been on uh, Twitter uh, tweeting a lot of, I think, Amari and lore uh, today. It's like five or six different parts of poems or something. And uh, I think he's hyped too. Cause after he finished it again, he was like, Ooh, that was too, uh, that was a long two hours or so he said that was a long time or something like that and then he said but that was awesome we should do this more often <laughs> and so you know this is great he is definitely uh passionate about eve online and he thinks about it in ways that is, are going to blow people away and i think this is the first time that players have a chance to kind of ask him questions real world questions that get him to display that knowledge and that's why this is such a good interview Excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's really encouraging to see his. I, I I feel like it's a renewed focus, right? In the last year or so, right? That the he's been like really hard at it again. Oh, I don't know, maybe even longer. I think I think we know that he probably stopped developing and playing Eve Online even before Incarna, right? Because he's the CEO of the company, he has to worry about the future of the company, the diversity of products. Uh, one little sneak peek: he does mention how long he thought Eve would survive and it was only a few years. And so they were trying to put their next title together, their next two titles together. And so that's his frame of mind back in 2007, 2009, right? They've already built up Eve online to 200,000 players. And to them, that was a victory. It was called the March to 200,000, I think. And so at that point he's, he's transitioning to work on other things. So he kind of comes away from the Eve direction um, at the, at about that time, that was a long time ago. So he started playing Eve online, uh, not that long ago, again, started playing it as a player to, to see what it's like as a new player coming into it. And his, his comparison of what Eve used to be with what Eve, Eve is now, uh, he talks a little bit about that and just how different that experience is. If you want to, I think something that you should do is go to talkinginstations.com and check out the first interview we did with him on March 30th. And uh, he talks a lot about uh, coming back as a player. And he covers that. He also covers some of the technology. But uh, I will say this latest interview is a really, a really good second part to that first interview. And then it goes far beyond even what we expected. Uh, and he talks a lot about um, technology, theory, um, and uh, just what Eve is is really supposed to be. And uh, I think again, it shows an incredible, uh, incredible knowledge base. I mean, this this guy knows this game because, in a, in a way, it really he's one of the authors of this game. So if you like Eve Online, 
do not underestimate Hilmar's um, dream of what it could be. And not only his dream, but also his power to make that dream a reality. He is the CEO of CCP after all. All right, for the, for the stream viewers, we're going to take a small pause so that we can change channels and have the bot actually record this so the podcast listeners can hear. Okay, and we're good to go again. <laughs> Anything else on the Hilmar interview? Nope. Just want to say, check it out on Sunday, this Sunday. Uh, it will be presented at the usual time of 1600 UTC. Uh, again, there will be a reaction uh, Q&A to happen right after the video. It's a two-hour block, but it's definitely worth your two hours. So check it out. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, Matterall, and giving us that little preview and behind-the-scenes information on the Helmar interview. But let's let's jump into the meat of today's show, and it is aptly titled "Fuedit is Recruiting," and I am quite proud of this name. Although I suspect Matterall will change it when he finally posts it to the website for marketing reasons. But I like this name because it's a fantastic pun, in my opinion, on Fuedit's origins. So can Niv or Exxon, one of you two, take it away? How did Fuedit get started? Yeah, so I can do it. Um, so this is Niv. I'm the CEO of uh, Free Greens Chickens, the alliance that uh, Fuedit is in right now. So the name Fuedit aptly came from Dreadit. Uh, Fuedit used to be, many, many moons ago, the um, faction warfare side of Dreadit or Test. Um, Back when about faction warfare first started, so but over the years, um, you know, there was a very big schism, and it kind of broke off from there. But um, I think we had the wonderful opportunity to um, kind of play and be in faction warfare when there was this very first iteration, which was vastly different than what it currently is now. And I think a lot of people probably look at it as one of the best iterations. The mechanics were much worse and. You cut out a little bit there. You said the mechanics were worse, but... Oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, the, the mechanics have changed over the years, and I think for the better, but at least back in the first iteration of Faction Warfare, a lot more people um, probably were playing in Faction Warfare for the sake of playing, so there was definitely a lot more brawls and everything, and I think it, we definitely had a lot more fun back then. I suppose before we go into the narrative of your history arc, so to speak, we should talk about where people may have heard of your group. And I think people may not have heard of your group, but they've seen it because you guys advertise a lot on the New Eden Report website. And you also have a very memorable logo. Can you tell me, how did you guys get your, your Space Chicken logo? For the podcast listeners, I'm sure you've seen it before, but if you haven't, it's just a very, it's a cartoonified chicken inside of like a big old bubble, like a glass bubble. Think a, a goldfish tank stuck over its head as though it's in space, like the old the old 50s astronaut get up type thing. How did you how did you come across that logo? So actually, I do have the link from it that we still got it from. I just posted it in notes. I don't know how's the best way to show your audience. But uh, one of the previous members of Poetic, Poetic Stanza, um, we were looking to um, looking into logo ideas. And he saw this kind of little comic that we then um, emailed the creator for and asked, you know, we really love your logo, can we use it? And we st I still have that email to keep it because every now and then someone asks me about copyrights on it because we technically asked someone else for it. And um, that's kind of where it started. So we had Fuedet along with the chicken, along with the Alliance used to be called I Whip My Slaves Back and Forth aptly named after the song with my hair back and forth back in the day. All of them don't really tie together along with the logo uh, J4. What was the, uh, the ticker oh, along with The ticker along, well, along with the ticker J4LP, which was joined for LP, um, that kind of formed the basis of our alliance back then. Um, so we kind of had the very, we, we, we did the very narrative-driven um, 
Faction Warfare Alliance back then. We did a lot of propaganda, um, and we we kind of uh, we drove a strong narrative of kind of this dirty Mimitar uh, with the Holy Amarian War. And um, you know, we I think we had a lot of fun with that. We had even a couple Holy Wars uh, where um, we essentially content would be made up based on. Um, just, I really don't like this guy. Let's go shoot him for now. So, so the the holy yeah. war thing is is interesting to me. Did you? Con- I'm skipping ahead in the timeline a bit here, just to give a, a bit of an overview for folks. Fuedit has been in faction warfare as well as Sovnovern pardon me, sovereignty null sex space multiple times throughout its history. It's sort of flip flop back and forth. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But did you continue the sort of, we're just going to make war with people for the sake of making war outside of faction warfare? Or was that just in your early days? So I'd like to say we try to keep this whole narrative up. Unfortunately, um, I haven't been as good as creating it as my previous counterpart. Um, but definitely, I think the idea of content for the sake of content can really drive a lot of really great conflicts. Um, and of course, then we'd always put some sort of a re- rationale behind it later on. And that's a lot of what drove Faction Warfare. Faction Warfare, I think, is really great for a lot of smaller corpse alliances uh, because it essentially just gives you a reason to fight. You don't really need one. You just go, oh, my God, it's the other side. I just want to go shoot the other side. And that was kind of really a great way for people to make coalitions, friends, and enemies without really needing um, any infrastructure for that. So I think that's really good. But as with all groups, and you know, like FedUp's group, um, like uh, Silver's group and FedUp, um, there's unfortunately kind of a size limit where once you kind of get too large, um, it kind of doesn't become fun anymore or nobody really wants to fight you. So unfortunately, because you're fighting for the sake of fighting, also people won't fight you because they don't really want to fight you, nor have to. I see. So let's let's hop back on this narrative train. And we left off, Fuedet initially was founded, they are part of Dreadit, and you guys did Faction Warfare. Where'd you go from there? So um, we actually paired up with a lot of groups, like Dirt and Glitter, that you guys had on your show a couple weeks back. Um, and we uh, we continue fighting in that in, in faction warfare, and there was actually a lot of kind of parallels to faction warfare today. Where um, for us, uh, Pandemic Legion was the biggest uh, dirty group that would drop supers on us on our small uh, T1 ships, similar to kind of many other larger groups today. Um, then the fa- uh, Fountain War hit, and that's kind of when we uh, picked a side and we aligned more with the um, goons or CFC back then rather than with the test side. And that's where we also broke off from test. And um, actually, we did know some of the test FCs. DBRB used to, um, or sorry, not DBRB. Um, There actually used to be some um, test FCs that would actually also FC for us. Um, So we kind of, some of them still do remember. When so and then but then when the um, fountain war hit, uh, we actually also we got some Sov and delve um, as this um, as kind of reward for uh, helping them out. Uh, but then as we kept growing larger, we again hit this issue of just being kind of too big for faction warfare. And then right around um, when uh, Phoebe Sov hit, uh, hit, that's when a lot of alliances were consolidating, like they kind of have been. For the past couple of years, um, consolidating Sov, we moved up to Veil, vale, and that's when we actually joined um, CFC proper for a short period of time. So that's kind of kind of that first seg between low sec, null sec, and um, kind of low sec is really great for this um, casual content. It's very easy to find a roam. Uh, but this kind of um, if you ever want to do anything bigger like strat ops, we found it really hard to get people to want to train to larger ships. For example, um, as fa- a matter of fact, in warfare, we, we flew a lot of Mars ships. Even just getting people into Zealots was probably a lot of teeth pulling back in our first iteration, um, just because nobody really had to fly anything very high skill. You would just fly frigate and go blab somebody in a small plex. Interesting. So I have to ask, uh, a lot of discussion nowadays around NullSec has to do with the infrastructure 
that is in place. And you just mentioned that you get, you really like sort of the skill point infrastructure, so to speak, in order to do the null sec doctrine type thing. Back when you were first transitioning into solve null out of faction warfare, did you also have an infrastructure problem, or was that not an issue with the mechanics of the time? Like, so did actually, you have the, jump freighters and titans and things like that? Act, and definitely not. One of the biggest issues with faction warfare, and it still is, is actually um, corporate and alliance income. Because faction warfare, you can't really tax it, uh, as most of the money actually comes from the LP, and you can't really tax LP. Um, I've seen over the years many kind of ways to uh, try to make money ranging from like LP buybacks um, to trying to, well, back then when moons were still a thing, um, having corporation or alliance owned moons. But because of this lack of kind of higher um, global income, actually it is also very hard to get people to be able to provide much for anyone other than um, we would provide what we call FUI, which is just a bunch of cheaper ships. And I think, uh, you know, I remember Silver also talked about something similar um, back when uh, Fed, Up was, Fed Up was still. Um, really heavily into um, faction warfare. So as a um, kind of as a budding new uh, alliance or corporation thing, faction warfare definitely has a strong points, but it's um, kind of weak points, which still show even five, six years later, um, really become apparent the older and the more experienced that your group grows. Yeah, it's sort of like a glass ceiling, right? Now, like when you want to move oh, yeah, to the definitely. next level, you can't do... Ship SRP replacements because you don't have a an alliance level down income. You it's you're asking people to spend their own money on more and more things. Infrastructure is limited because how do you pay for like when Citadels came out? How do you pay for Fortizar? How do you buy your Keepstar when all your alliance risk is in the wallets of your individuals? So yeah, you, you kind of bump up against that ceiling of income and content, and then you got to make a decision. Yeah, and that, that's a lot of this um, reasoning between this whole going back and forth between kind of low sec and all sec. Um, you know, even Test at one point even did Kaldari uh, Faction Warfare, I remember, for that short stint a couple years ago. Um, it kind of can help you kickstart, but it doesn't sustain you at all. And, and, and it actually it really shows in low sec these days where you'll essentially see this ebb and flow of um, low sec activity and no faction warfare activity of just uh, this new influx comes uh, this new influx comes in but as this new influx gets older they have to go find somewhere else um, also unfortunately well, also um, you'll also see this influx of um, or sorry this ebb and flow of kind of content being on the west faction warfare versus the east faction warfare that's the you know, the um, Amar um, Mimitar versus the Galante Kaldari it tends to be that um, content balls up such that um, each kind of even though there's 2v2 faction warfare, you'll see them, um, you'll see a lot of groups kind of move to one side or another side until content dries and then move back to the other side. So I do remember um, back in my faction warfare days, like I would go to Placid sometimes, or we would deploy to Placid sometimes when the MR faction warfare side was drying up. Gotcha. Okay. So let's, let's go back to the narrative a bit here. Uh, we left off, you moved to Delve, or you got a bit of space in Delve due to your interactions with the Fountain War. What happened next? Yeah, so we had a bit of space from Delve, um, but then we a lot of we um, we consolidated into um, Vale along with a lot of groups during Phoebe Sov where finally all these jump changes hit the first time around. That's when um, fatigue was first introduced. Um, with that, uh, we found uh, that's also when we dropped Faction Warfare. Uh, because again, the whole we wanted to be able to do higher SP, more strat up things. But we found out that um, Nullsec also has its um, up and down. Where for a lot of Nullsec, um, it's great that you can get a lot of more strat up fights, more strategic fights, bigger fights. But this the daily content was much much harder to find, and we did lose a lot of members there. Um, back then, also we were neighbors with um, Pizza Confederation in Gemini, and that's kind of where we found the kind of this niche that we we really liked. Um, that's where pizza back pizza back then did a lot of kind of smaller higher SP roams, a lot of blopsing, and kind of kept it a little more tight knit like that, and that was quite nice. But um, we did bleed a lot through um, joining Nullsec, and um, as 
um, CFC kept consolidating more. They also that's also where Bastion started, where they kind of tried to grab a lot of these small alliances that they had in the coalition and just tell them to either join under one ma- massive alliance or essentially get kicked out. So we chose the latter as we wanted to be able to keep our um, alliance name and want to keep our identity. And that's where uh, we were uh, given Cloud Ring and essentially were kind of a meat shield status for a while. Um, we didn't need all of Cloud Ring, and, but um, that's where we fought a lot against um, actually Iron Armada with Lethal Intent back then, which was called Lethal Iron Boards, and um, we fought a lot with Culture. Um, this is also right around the time when the first, when Intosising, the very first Intosising was introduced. And Intosising as a smaller alliance was awful for us because the, there were just, um, we didn't have the, as a small alliance, we just did not have the infrastructure to be able to um, well, essentially defensive Intosis daily, while culture, a much larger group, could just come at whim and just take down your station, your iHub, your TCU, etc. Yeah, it's those station attacks that they used to happen that were pretty grinding on you, right? Yeah, because stations can happen all the time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you know, for for as much as you know, there's there's pros and cons to tosing, but definitely, uh, my my opinion has been that um, there's kind of that entosis sov has been really hard on these smaller groups, and you know maybe one could argue that these smaller groups don't deserve the sov, but it is it was definitely. Uh, very taxing to have to. I couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't deploy anywhere because literally the only thing we could do was defend ourselves. And that kind of took up the whole day because there was only so many of us. So did you get kicked out or did you sort of leave of your own volition because you were, you so were tired event- of the mechanics? So eventually that's when the Goon Viceroy Viceroy program came, which was their, um, not, it wasn't renting, rather it was the more of a coercion where you pay this amount and we'll let you stay. If you don't, we'll leave. And nobody took that up. So we also left along with it. And we have a great meme of saying chickens don't have knees, so we can't bend a knee for you. Wait, do chickens actually not have knees? Is this anatomically correct? (laughs) Let's go with it. I don't know. Double check. Um, so essentially we were kicked out, but it was probably, um, a welcome, uh, it was probably more than welcome because we were just getting tired from all this intosis thing. So, um, we decided to try to go back to our roots. And this is when the second time we did faction warfare, um, we went back to a lot of our old faction warfare friends like dirt and glitter. Um, and, and we tried it again, but this time as we had, um, this higher SP, uh, higher skill level, it really wasn't as much fun anymore, and we didn't really know what to do with ourselves, because um, you can only do so many T1 frigate fights every day before kind of getting bored of it, essentially. So right, you, you lose that strat up feel, right? That purpose exactly, of yeah. fighting after a while. Like, Yeah, it's great, you can roam around and probably get a fight, but how many times can you blow up some ships without there being some meaning behind it, right? Yeah, exactly. And the and the big fights, which are the iHub fights, um, it's just normally a bunch of what catalysts, atrons, just trying to cram into a plex. Uh, it's, it's a fun um, blender f- f- uh, brawl fest, but it also kind of just gets on you after a while. It doesn't really. There's no. There's not really a lot of substance to it. Also, the bots. So many faction warfare bots. <laughs> So your second time back, um, you were like underwhelmed a little bit and be like, oh yeah, I remember why we left. It was, how long did that take? So that took a couple months, but mainly um, it, we, our stint only lasted a couple months because Elo and, was, and um, some of his other, uh, this was around the time when Black Legion disbanded the first time around. Elo reached out to us along with a couple other uh, XB talking about doing uh, essentially White Legion, which was Black Legion 2.0. So we actually took that. We took that opportunity to leave Amar Faction Warfare and try something completely different. Now this is where we start going from catering towards the low end to of uh, skill to more of the high end of skill. Uh, this is at the time of excuse me. Uh, this is at the time of uh, World War B Casino Wars. So immediately Elo gets subcontracted by uh, Mitani to help them screen. Um, a lot, you know, literally everyone in Eve who's against them right now to help them, help them kind of relieve some pressure by just running um, really annoying mutant fleets, you know, 
as, as one trick pony, right? Um, running Munin fleets around uh, kind of parts where goons could not hit. So that was really fun. Um, Elo was a really great FC, a really great person. But unfortunately, um, he the there's a big you know there's a big personality around him. He's a really uh, when there wasn't a Elo fleet running around, nobody else really wanted to run a fleet. So kind of when he kind of got busy with work, kind of stopped playing a little bit, that kind of crashed down too. So our, our second stint in faction warfare and our second our stint with um, White Legion wasn't as um, that really long, and um, they they were quite short so what happened after that actually no before i before i ask that question i do want to make one point of clarification chickens do in fact have knees google says so let's move on damn all right well there goes our uh, propaganda hey it's even stronger you just chose not to yeah ah that's a good one yeah a strong independent chicken who don't need no that's right (laughs) In any case, strong independent chicken leaves White Legion. Where do you go? So we did a little bit of alliance shopping right around when um, a lot of the leadership was going AFK, and um, we decided to join in it. Also, at the same time, we didn't exactly leave a lot for the alliance to be kept with, and we also uh, took the alliance wallet on our way. Ooh. So we, that wasn't exactly an amicable um, breakup, um, and I, I think I have the Reddit post here. Uh, How much did you a... steal? You're talking about White Legion's wallet? Yeah, yeah, I have it right here. Let me go pull it up. Uh, we stole probably 30 to 50 bill. Unfortunately, I didn't see a lot of it myself. Um, but um, it was the, the end of White Legion was fairly toxic. Unfortunately, that was one of our more dirtier breakups. But um, then we uh, took a little bit of line shopping and we decided to join in at this time. So um, Exxon can take it from here. He knows the rest. Yeah, so we joined in it kind of looking for that bigger null sec fleet uh, kind of style of content, kind of catering to the more higher skilled pilots. And it and, you know, was closer to what we were doing in White Legion. Um, being an in it was great for us in a lot of ways and not great for us in other ways. Um, in it, as you guys know, is a EU time zone focus group. Uh, and we're not. We're a US time zone focus group. Uh, that was great because we got to have a lot of autonomy. Uh, it was great for recruitment because anyone who wanted to join US time zone and in it would inevitably join us. Um, but it wasn't so great at things like coordination with the EU time zone team. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of like AU time zone guys. There wasn't really a lot of overlap. So timers would fall through the cracks or, you know, we would set up something in US time zone, but not get the support in EU time zone. Um, so there are some issues there. But overall, we like flying with the guys. It just what didn't end up being uh, the best uh, cultural fit for us. And it ended up being the best fit for us content wise. Um, we also started to realize that maybe being in the, the big giant blobs wasn't the kind of gameplay our guys were looking for. Um, I mean, traditionally, we've always been kind of a smaller group, um, kind of gone from being a smaller group to a larger group and smaller and larger and so on and so forth, rejoining Faction War and getting out of it and rejoining and getting out of it. Um, but probably about a halfway through our stay in it, about a year in, uh, a lot of the members started to get really, really fed up with the whole big blue donut. Uh, you know, fleets where you've got 20 guys and they're going out in a Rome is a ton of fun. But when you bring that number up to 250, uh, a lot of the fun goes away for a lot of the members. You know, you feel more like uh, a person who's just there to press the F1 key. Uh, even in some of the more advanced doctrines, like when Panda would run his snatch fleets, those were great. Um, but those fleets were, you know, few and far between for what we wanted to do. Uh, you know, whenever Panda wanted to run a fleet, he would have to stay up very, very late for our guys to be able to come on those fleets. That being said, uh, that experience was good because we got we I personally learned a lot on how to kind of lead those bigger block uh, engagements. And I also served as in its head diplomat for about seven months. Uh, And that really showed a whole nother aspect of the game to me. And because what it uh, what it has such a storied history and basically anywhere I go, people have heard about what or mentioned that, oh, I, you know, I was in what a while back or. Uh, oh, yeah, you guys are the Chicken Alliance or whatever. Um, being able to leverage that history um, for things like 
bull training up in low sec, which is kind of more of what we do now, has been really, really helpful um, for our future. So I've just found an image in the, the pile of propaganda you linked me, which is the fueted icon, but it's a horse, I think. So what that is, is our that's our retarded horse that we had for our uh, White Legion logo because the White Legion lasted literally so short that we didn't even have time to make an Alliance logo. We, uh, Pinky Fel I think Pinky Feldman made this one. Uh, still have an old one laying around. Oh boy. That's pretty funny. Nice. And, and that's what we try to do with our Alliance. We try to keep it very lighthearted. Um, a lot of our members also play games outside uh, together outside of Eve, and I think that's what keeps people sticking together over the years. Um, actually, one one joke that we have is um, we used to play Dota with a lot of PL people and or PL and Waffles, and uh, Dota almost killed those alliances when the, that was during its uh, heyday. Mm. Yeah, one thing we try to stress in Fueda is that the community is far more important to us than anything you do in game. Um, where our recruitment is mostly based on, are you active in Discord? Okay, uh, we don't really care if you play the game or not. We want you to be active in our community and and think of our culture and our community before other groups. So it's, like something, go on. I find it really interesting that it works for you because like back in MC, it was a big MC being Mercenary Coalition, which I was a member of for two, two and a half years. Um, it was a big deal where people got really angry about, we called them Slack Warriors, but in this case they'd be Discord Warriors. They didn't actually play the game. They just sat on comms or in Discord or Slack and were just super freaking toxic and made drama and gave their input but never contributed to anything. And people really didn't like that. But you guys, that is your culture. You, you sort of breed that, so to speak. Am I getting that right? How does that work? Well, and definitely that is a thing that even we would have because there are people that go, back in my day, we did X, Y, Z. Um, and they have all talk and not really a lot of substance to them. Uh, and that, that's always going to be a problem as you, if you keep up a social group as such. Uh, we try to keep, we just have one single rule in our lines, don't be a dick. And whether you're young or old, um, we try very hard to adhere to that. Um, as long as you keep a culture of kind of everyone, your, everyone's family, you should learn from each other. You can help each other out. Uh, I think that kind of keeps you going. But it's definitely very easy to spiral like that. Also, being that um, you guys all play video, we all play video games outside of Eve. It's also very easy to spiral out of just not playing Eve when the latest and greatest new game comes out, when the Poe update comes out, or whatever like that. So uh, it has its positives and negatives. Positive being it keeps people going when there's not a lot to do in Eve. Negative also it can also draw away from that. Um, when something more shiny or interesting comes up. Interesting. So one thing we try to, or at least I try to emphasize in our alliance is that strong individual players make strong corporations and strong corporations make strong alliances and strong alliances make strong coalitions. So it's the same motive what it's adopted while we weren't in it. We want you to think of what it first. We want you to be a member of what it first and the alliance second and the coalition third. Um, that has kind of really helped us keep our culture throughout all the shifts uh, and especially kind of being a little bit of the odd one out uh, like to give in its example because that was the time when i was there we were the u.s time zone guys and an eu time zone group and just that differentiation in its own helped us kind of preserve our own culture yeah and mainly because we also do stuff outside of Eve, uh, as in just being social in Discord. Um, also, we do have our own tech guys to set up our own services. Um, just keeping the distinction also helped us kind of uh, roll through all these different iterations. And that, that was actually a really big thing that I remember talking to about when we first joined in it. We were just wondering, because um, that was the first time we were going to actually disband the Alliance and focus as a corp. Um, this discussion of how do you keep your culture, what, what you have now when moving into a new Alliance, because it's, it's a big, scary transition. So when you left in it, did you guys like steal the alliance wallet again? What what happened? <laughs> no, we didn't this time. We should have. We should, wow. Uh, no, I didn't actually have access to any of the wallets as much as I wish I did. But um, we tried to leave uh, and on, on as good as terms as we could. Um, we actually did leave amicably. Uh, we were the ones that went to Bliss and was like, hey, we're, we're getting out of here. 
a couple days after we left, though, there was some drama that went down that definitely did complicate the leaving process a little bit. Um, luckily, though, Fwet has a lot of friends. Um, we, have, we have a Discord server called Friends of the Chicken. It's got a lot of people in it. Um, getting our assets out after being stripped of our blue status and ACL access was thankfully not at all an issue for us. But um, since then, uh, we survived for a little bit um, just as a corp, basically trying to provide some content for our guys while we tried to figure out what our next steps are. Uh, the content we like to provide is kind of, uh, we call it like the triad of content, right? Uh, we like to do uh, have really, really solid roaming content, small group, you know, 10 to 30 guys going out in low sec or no sec and, and getting some frags and not having too many strings attached. Uh, we also like to drop capitals. Uh, having a dread is a really important thing in the culture of Fwedit. In fact, uh, it seldom does a person join our Discord and we don't ask them if they have a dread alt and you when they're joining Fwedit. Yeah, we like to feed dreads. We do not care. I don't care if we lose our dreads. When you drop the dread, uh, it's, it's, no one cares if you lose it. We just want you to drop it and have some fun, right? Uh, leveraging our connections, we're able to get into a lot of the kind of bigger fights and also pull other groups to join the bigger fights with us so we can really get some more uh, airtime with those capitals. Because although we might not be able to own supers or titans, we can at least have some fun with our carriers and dreads. Uh, no, the third yeah, the third wing of our flock, so to speak, is our Bok Ops, which is Black Ops. Uh, we have a lot of guys who are very into Bok Ops. They're very into going and getting surprise on enemies. And we have assets literally all throughout the galaxy um, because of how we make money uh, to kind of leverage those dreads and leverage uh, staging systems and bombers and, and uh, whatnot to, to go and hunt really wherever we want. Uh, a lot of the times we'll stage, uh, we'll, we'll have like a forward staging for Bok Ops and that'll change every month or every couple of months, uh, something like that, just to you know keep our enemies on their toes uh, involving that. You mentioned uh, the way in which you make money. I, we were talking a bit before the show, and you mentioned that you guys, before the moon mining changes, so back when moon mining was just a module you put on a pause, and it did it automatically for you, you just had to collect it and take it to market once a month or something like that. You guys got a lot of moons in Syndicate, but then all of that changed when moon mining happened, and you guys didn't mine the moons, didn't want to mine the moons, couldn't mine the moons? What happened there? I can answer this one. So kind of a theme that you've been hearing is as more of these um, updates are being made to EVE into the mechanics, uh, prob I feel like a lot of them have been really hurting these the small to mid-range alliances. Um, moon mining also being one of them. Uh, when we first did, when we first were in Faction Warfare, uh, even a small group, well, we weren't that small back then, but even a group of ours could be making money off of passive moon mining. But with the new moon mining where you have to mine it yourself, it's much, much harder to manage as a small group. And it's just been very difficult also to mine. Also, mining in low sec is kind of probably one of the most dangerous things you can do because there's just so much traffic. So uh, that's just something that we haven't been really able to touch and have. And kind of, I don't know, as, as more game mechanics keep changing, I feel like a lot more opportunities like moon mining become more kind of taken away from us. So right now for ISK making, it's still possible to make ISK without, um, say, for example, SAW, if we do have one system. Um, Abyssals has kind of been our boon. Um, and it's been really great to be able to tell people, hey, um, for 15 minutes um, with you know, a ship, you can easily make a decent amount of ISK per hour. You can do it anywhere you want. Um, you don't need anyone else's help. Um, that has been kind of our saving grace so far. It sounds like you're, you're back to the situation in which you can't tax your members' income. Like, abyssals are great, but unless you've got a buyback program for all that dank loot, people are just going to do it in high sec, one jump out of Jita, and sell it straight to Jita, and the Alliance doesn't see any of that ISK. Yep, exactly. And I, I feel that um, probably as, an, uh, as a low sec, if I was a even more low sec centric alliance, I would probably have an even harder time to get any sort of corp alliance income than I had like uh, say five plus years ago. So I feel that like if you want, again, it goes back to the, if you want to be able to do this progression, you keep, we keep getting driven really hard into saying, no, you got to do this null thing, or you have to be large enough of 
that you are allowed to do this low sec thing because large enough groups can easily mine these low sec moons. It's just we don't have the ability to without getting hazed on. Yeah, a lot of the the issue with mining low sec moons or really doing any money making in low sec is just the imbalance of power that that area of space is seeing, right? Um, if we were to mine a moon, snuff would drop on us. There's no question about that. Or another bigger group, and literally anyone with supers or titans will drop them because they know we can't respond to it. And they know that's the case for 99% of the people who live in low sec. Hmm. Even with yeah, like... I think I know how that feels. Is it because yeah, you don't have enough... Power. Like, immediately when you say that, some some person, who I'm not going to insult, but some theoretical person would say, uh, but just drop dreads, just dread bomb them, lol forehead. Does that work? Does that not work? Let's, let's chat well, about that. It's, it's a good idea, right? But when your opponent can field more faxes than you can field dreads uh, and quicker, it doesn't really help you. Uh, we've tried to set up multiple dread bombs in the past. I'll be completely honest with it. Uh, I'll, Snuff has a... I, I'll give them credit. They have a very good spy network. It's very hard to get enough dreads together, especially being, you know, most low set groups are like 50 to 200 people. We can call most of them and get most of them to show up to shoot Snuff, um, but we cannot... We have to bat phone really, really hard to be able to form enough to be able to make a difference. Anyone that's going to be a threat to snuff, they'll see coming. Yeah, essentially. Right? So, like, look at that last battle report with goons, right? <laughs> I think snuff didn't know that was coming. Like, so it's it's very difficult for somebody of a uh, uh, foot size or my size to to beat them at that game because they're just too good at it, right? Yeah. So I, I think. Um... I think in low sec right now, I'm sorry, there's this gap where if you're a small enough group, you don't really care. You can ignore a lot of things, probably, you know, say up to the 100 to 200 person range. Then as you hit this 200 person range and kind of like, you know, like how fed up was silver, um, then you start becoming big enough that you kind of people notice you, but you're not big enough to really do a lot about it. And then if you're really big, you know, I don't know, say 500 plus, then you kind of hit this. Um, you go past this hurdle and then you actually are big enough to fight back. But probably between this 200 to 500 person range in low sec, it is very hard. Um, you know, to, you're too big to get small gang fights, but too small to do big people, uh, big group fights. And yeah. kind of what are you supposed to do? I, I totally exactly understand. exactly how it is, right? We had this discussion months ago. Yeah, you're too big to fight any of the 200 person groups and you're too small to fight snuff. So what do you do every night? Or not even snuff, just in, in general, right? No, um, snuff, but yeah. <laughs> well, here, here's the issue. Without uh, low sec groups can band together and Voltron up, and I can form 200 low sec dudes in a fleet given enough time, but unless we get the support of another 500 to 1,000 man group, another one of the big null sec blocks, snuff problem is going to continue to be an issue, and it's going to be an issue for everyone in low sec. But, but not to be completely negative on it, there's definitely still lots of things to do. In low sec, uh, obviously there's that elephant in the room, but um, we've still, you know, Exxon, we have still thrived oh, um, yeah, with, sure. with this. Um, so not, not to push anyone away from low sec, it's just uh, as long as you're aware of your risks and understand your boundaries, I think you can be very successful um, in whatever endeavors. Like, for example, um, yeah, even Dirt and Glitter, who just came back, they seem very healthy now. And it's always great to see, it's always great to see more life in low sec. Um, you know, anywhere you go, just having more people literally makes it more fun. Uh, so definitely please come back to low sec. But there also are inherent issues as to why they left in the first place. So I know we talked about it a little bit last episode, where we went pretty in-depth on faction warfare. Uh, I say we. I wasn't there. Thank you for Ron and Silver for holding down the fort for me, and for McLeod for doing the engineering that show. But it was discussed the, the possibility, in fact, it, it's been happening to some extent, where as a result of Blackout, Certain null sec players who don't want to do the no local null sec thing are going to low sec and specifically faction warfare low sec. There, are you seeing that in your group? I, I think we are. Um, I don't know about oh. null sec players transitioning to low sec, but we have a lot of players that left the game and that are coming back. I think in the past couple of weeks since Blackout was announced, we've probably had five or six guys come back or uh, be interested in coming back? The news of Blackout has helped us more than the actual physical Blackout. I think that's a pretty good way of saying it. 
we, we like a lot of bitter bits have come back because saying, oh, I heard about this whole local change. And I think that propaganda is great. I think the advertisement is great. Uh, I don't know, personal opinion, Blackout is a little, was it uh, hitting a fly with a nail or with a hammer? But at least it's always good to see more people again. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will add, I think that Blackout existing is good for LowSec because I think it gives a better distinction between what is LowSec and what is NullSec. And I think anything that's going to convince someone to go from NullSec, from the big blob, I'm going to push F1 and sit in a fleet of 500 people kind of gameplay to the small gang, I'm actually flying my ship, I'm communicating with these 20 other guys I've gotten fleet uh, and accomplishing a small goal or just going out and getting a bunch of frags. Yeah. I think having that distinction is going to help low sec. And I think yeah. if the more they can do to fix low sec and some of the big issues with that, I think the better the game is going to be overall, because I think low sec is a nice uh, kind of tr way to transition players from the high sec kind of gameplay to the more PVP focused aspects of the game. And I know it was talked about a lot, so I don't want to dwell too much on Blackout. But uh, again, I do think that Blackout did really affect smaller and medium-sized alliances more because those are the groups that don't have this ability to do infrastructure to kind of keep eyes on every gate, make sure they keep their um, space safe. It's been if that was a if I took my current alliance numbers and tried to do more null sex soft stuff, it would definitely be much harder than it was last month. But on the flip side to that, roaming Nullsec is so much more fun now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, well, it... yeah, I'd agree with you, Niv. And I was worried about that, you know, because we we're kind of similar sizes when Blackout hit. But I've also been pleased with the the way we've adapted. And you, you know, you can say what you want. Yeah, we're part of Legacy and stuff, but we still have to take care of our own people. We're right on the border of stuff. So the, the meta shift has surprised me. I really thought people would like leave and tell me, ah, Silver, I can't do this anymore, or we can't ain't maintain ADMs because I can't see who's in local. But, you know, it's not been as bad in that aspect as I really thought. Yeah, and I remember I, I listened to your show last week. You talked about it, and a lot more people. As long as people join standing fleets, kind of essentially – be cognizant and awake that, that kind of mitigates most of people's um, quality. Let me ask you something. You guys said that roaming null sec is more fun now. And we'll get, we'll get back to the narrative of you guys in a second, but um, I think this is kind of important. Do you find that you're running into less sheep and more wolves in sheep clothing? Like, is there less like straight up prey that you're just ganking and more people ready to fight? Have you seen that? I definitely think so. It feels like um, because you are essentially forcing people to be more cognizant, the people who are left are pretty awake and aware. And it's definitely um, when you find something, you're like, well, is it bait? Is it real? Is it not? Um, I definitely have questioned that more than I would have previously. Because previously, maybe this guy is actually a botter or maybe this guy is actually just falling asleep on this keyboard. But now when you see it, you're kind of like, why am I really seeing this guy in space waiting for me to kill him? Yeah, and on that note, I'll add that, um, I think I've mentioned this before elsewhere, but the responses we're getting from from like tackling carriers in Delve or tackling, tackling carriers anywhere else is instead of dropping like 10 Titans on you, they're more likely to drop like maybe one or two carriers first and test the water a little bit and maybe draw, if you do have a dread bomb plan, draw that out so they don't get, you know, they don't eat crap to that. The response time has been pretty... Good. It has been getting better. Of course, there's still dumb people. There's still fights over dumb people. But I think overall response time seems to be being a little higher. Up. So you do a lot of the, the roaming and null sec, especially since Blackout. What else do you guys do as the current iteration of Whetit and Free Range Chickens? What's your, what's your activity like? So uh, a fun thing that I think Exxon would love to focus on is we've currently been doing a lot of trig. Uh, stuff. So as the new Trig ships came out, um, the Nurgle, along with the other two ships whose name escapes me, uh, we have been running a lot of Nurgle roams. Um, and Ixan, as we proudly stated, we are currently... Are we, uh, Ixan, I think we had, as of EVE Toronto, we had the most amount of Nurgle losses, or we had... Yeah. Was when, it 10%? Uh, so we had like six people who went to EVE North, and when they pulled up the slides about Nurgle losses, and we heard there were only like 40 that were lost in the game in that point we all just looked at each other and like have we lost more nurgles than anyone else in the game right now and the answer was yes we lost about 10 percent of all nurgles so far as of june for those unfamiliar the nurgle is the new triglavian assault frigate isn't it still like 400 mil per ship 
Yeah, that's why yeah. they're not flowing a lot. Um, I was going to say, how the hell are you guys doing that? <laughs> You are making some oh, serious effective? bank like, in those abyssal sites. Are you just are you just doing it for the memes, or is it really like a cost-effective ship? I'm curious. Uh, Triglavian is anything but cost-effective right yeah. now, but Triglavian is a lot of fun, especially when you're a smaller group. Because of the weapon school mechanic, you might not be able to, to beat someone's logi or alpha them off the grid, but if you can stay on the grid for a little bit of time, you're going to break their logi, and you're going to get killed. Yeah, so do you think it's really the fact that it's you get all those utility highs that make it a good small gang ship? Well, the Nurgle definitely doesn't have a lot of utility high. On the, sm on the smaller end of the ships, they're much more uh, plain and vanilla. Um, the Nurgle fun part is mainly that, uh, yeah, it gets some. The new T2 ships all get this kind of double spool time. So instead of max DPS at 60 seconds, it's max DPS at 120 seconds. So they have a higher potential DPS, but you also got to stay on grid for a really long time. But it means that a small group of Nurgles could also just completely kill a carrier eventually, which is more, you can say, than most other ship types. Uh, of course, yeah, the cost makes them just kind of wildly more meme value for now. And until they go down, really, they're just relegated to being kind of a cool ship to just kind of dick around in. You don't do Drakovix or anything? Yeah, oh, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we've tried that. Not as much as the wormhole people do, but Kikimoras are definitely a big staple. Um, if you remember a lot of the um, kiting groups like Rogue Kadar Union and Exodus, you definitely see a lot of um, Kikis there. Um, until kind of that post nerf where they kind of slowed them down because otherwise previously it's a 40 it's a ship that can damage out to 40 kilometers and go extremely fast there's nothing you wouldn't want out of a shield uh, nano kiki okay. plus a full flight of freaking light drones kiki's were exactly, overpowered. Yeah. they needed nerfed hard yeah and i think it, it was the nerf was good maybe, maybe yeah. a little more i think the current iteration is pretty pretty good at the moment yeah, but definitely, the, I think the uh, so far we've been enjoying the whole Triglavian thing. Um, it took some time to kind of um, both both um, we've been enjoying Triglavians both the ships and kind of that PVE content. It kind of took some time to get used to to kind of understand some guides. Exxon has been spearheading that a lot, but um, it's um, it, it's kind of a nice side thing that we can. Yeah, the Triglavian invasions are really good fleet content that also makes people money which as a small gang low set group where making money at a, at a corp or alliance level or even you know some individual members struggle at it we can all go together get between five and 15 dudes sure we have to fix our sex status with tags but we can run down to jitta buy our ships and then go have a blast shooting triglavians and actually making money doing it yeah because mm -hmm. like um, the nice thing Exxon was, um, they're kind of like incursions where you have to do PB as a group, but the number of people required is much lower. It's almost like small gang incursions. I was about to ask, like, isn't incursions just better money? Sure, but we're only like, you know, we can form maybe 20, 25 dudes at most. Yes. Yeah. So as an alternative to jumping into an incursion gang fleet with like, you know, a bunch of people, you could just get together by yourselves as a corp or an alliance and and go do it, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I think. Gee, I like... wish drifters were like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it fills in that gap between large PV fleets and kind of your own solo thing. And that's been kind of nice. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what we were looking forward to with drifters. When drifters hit, I was like, gee, this might be cool on a down day where no one's around and there's nothing to fight. Oh, there's drifters in our system. We can fleet up and fight that. But that's not at all how drifters were. Yeah, so you know, I remember the first iteration of Drifters was that whole Drifter incursions where assault frigate only Drifters or something, or sorry, you can only bring assault frigates to Drifter in invasions, and they kind of tried to make it like incursion light, but then that kind of fell on its face. Well, I'm talking about the latest invasion of Nullsec, right? Uh, like you get the, the Drifter battleships supported by cruisers. Would have been cool if I could fight them like you guys are fighting Trig invasions, right? But that they're totally different things, and it didn't turn out that way. So I like that. I like that you're having fun with the trig stuff to fill in the downtime. I think, I hope that maybe drifters could be that for null seekers. I could see that. Oh, yeah, but yeah, another um, so to say, another content wing that we've been having again is a uh, blobs group. So we have been blobsing a lot into uh, areas like Geminit, um against Horde. That's always a fairly easy target, and in general we're 
really looking to kind of maximize the kind of content that we can do for our size. Now we've been lucky that we've managed to have a new corp join us recently. Um, but a lot of things are kind of closed off to you as a um, smaller group. Um, so you try to kind of maximize your fun in those things that are available. Yeah, it's a difficult dance for you to do. Are you, are you fighting anyone specifically, PvP-wise, or are you just uh, picking targets of opportunity at this point? Like, what, What's that look like? Uh, most, yeah, most of the time when we're joining up to fight someone specifically, it's Snuff. Because Snuff is really a, just a big issue for low sec in general right now, I feel like. Um, it's not the the good thing about fighting snuff is it's really easy to find people who also want to shoot snuff. Um, so basically, whenever there's a timer around us that is shooting snuff, you can probably expect us to show up and shoot them. And if snuff hits our stuff, you can expect us to call the rest of Losec to go and shoot snuff because it's just what we need to do in order to survive. Yeah, and I applaud you for picking up that torch. And, uh, I honestly wish we could be more part of it, but being so far away, it's difficult. But that's great. Am I, like, for those of you who can see this on a stream, am I insane, or does Snuff's activity look absolutely nuts? It seems like they're extremely active on one day of the week for, like, eight hours, and then the rest of the time there's just occasional activity. Are y'all seeing this? Uh, if you hover over each of the little boxes, it'll tell you the number of kills, and if they had a major fight during that time period. Yeah, see that? It just completely um, blinds out the rest of the week. Well, oh. I think they're also pretty much, like, very op-based, right? We're logging in to do this, then that, then this, then that. Like, they're not, like, roaming around getting random kills. They got, like, huge heat moments and then downtime, right? Yeah, um, they, they, they definitely have a wide variety of things to do. Like, um, if you ever come to Iron the Space, they might drop a work on you or something, too. In, in between, oh, yeah, that, team... that happened. That happened to me the other day. Yeah. So you can always... Yeah, uh, worm, it came through a wormhole and fought a bunch of battle rooks. That was kind of fun. Yeah, Snuff has been memeing with the battle rooks a lot lately. We see them undocked with, like, 13 rooks on their moons all the time. Yeah. <laughs> None of them actually mining. We came through a wormhole in Iwasoda and uh, wound up with, like, you know, 14 battle rooks. <laughs> Yeah, that's common. So I think it's definitely nice to see um, uh, the Mar Mimitar um, war on the east side being able to pick up some pace while we're out on our side of space. It's, you know, um, where one side's being a little more oppressive normally means that the other side gets to grow a little bit and um, kind of stretch out and do their own thing. Of course, until everyone hears about it, then we all drop in. There you go. There's the old battle rock on the screen. So do you guys change sides of faction warfare, or are you like hardcore, we are this particular empire's militia, so to speak? So it's actually pretty hard to flip sides based on mechanics. Yeah, standing. Sorry, that, yeah, standing. Yeah, you tank your standing. So right now I have terrible Mimitar standings, even from years ago. So um, how, do the, how do the farmers do it then? Farmers don't allergies. kill anybody. Oh, yeah. so that's how you lose the standings is because of killing people, not the actual like or running NPCs. the sites. You're constantly like you're constantly shooting and getting bad standings. Or I know hmm. what one I know a thing was would just be you have two characters on one account. One was a yeah, one side, one's the other side. Multiple whichever. multiple characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is a way to fix standings with tags and stuff. Not tags. Um, Missions. Uh, you can do a bunch right. of epic arcs and stuff. No, there's data site. Ah, uh, fuck, it's not data sites. There's some some way to fix it quickly, but yeah, most farmers just have multiple accounts, one on one side, one on the other. One's dormant, while the other one's working. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, the the farming aspect was it also really hurt faction warfare a lot. No matter how much you tried, essentially, you were just trying to roll a rock uphill. Um, no matter how hard your group or even your coalition, your militia worked. Um, the people who went to make money would always overcome whichever way that old faction warfare went. If the market really wanted to go to Mimitar, then Mimitar would be flooded. If the market really wanted to go to Mimitar, no matter how much you tried, it still would go to Mimitar. Um, that, that's yeah, kind of what's interesting is Galente always had the advantage of the VNI. VNI, right? yeah. So now I'm curious to see how that changes things, because now VNI is probably not going to be the lifeblood of EVE anymore. 
given that it's not really the riding ship of choice. So that Galente advantage of always having something of value is going to be knocked a bit, right? But on the other hand, um, yeah, so the value of your LP matter a lot. So uh, Kaldari Navy LP is not that interesting. There's a lot of ammos, but there's not that the big hitters were always for, like data cores and ships. There's not really that many on the Kaldari side that was ever kind of desired. Osprey Navy, maybe if you're going to make it. Yeah. One. How often? One. Like I remember we flew the shit out of those when they got cheap. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we we flew them too, but mainly because they were cheap. Um, it's like, same for the Augur Navy issue. Those used to be very, very popular. And because uh, because I remember Brave would just um, kill um, get killed in oodles of them. And because they were so popular, uh, pretty much you wouldn't have to try and uh, Amar would just hit T5 without even thinking. Can I pause I this conversation cool. for a second? CCP? Cool. Your July patch notes are titled June 2019. Rip. So it's the June release, but for some reason they segmented different aspects of the release to release on different times. So like the VNI uh, yeah, that's happened true. today, and yep. I think there was another change that happened like a week ago or two weeks ago. If you scroll down on what you have on the stream right now, it should show it. Um, but I actually do want to circle back to the Vexer Navy issue. Because I know a ton of people who are very, very excited about that now. While I personally don't care if it's no longer a good ratting ship. I never used it for that anyways. But now it's going to be so much more fun for small gangs and for solo uh, PvPers to roam in. I know we already have a couple of doctrines cooking in some of our fitting channels. And I believe we probably already have some purchased in our way to go and take out for a fleet. So okay. for anyone who missed it, the changes to the Vex and Navy issue are that the biggest one that affects the Ratters is you can no longer field five heavy drones. Its bandwidth was taken down from 125 to 75, so you can do three heavy drones, or actually there's a, a higher damage mix that you can do with some mediums and some lights, but you pick that damage back up in the form of a new bonus to your uh, hybrid turret damage and tracking speed. So the bonuses on the new VNI are 10% to drone hit points damage and tracking, as well as 10% bonus to medium hybrid turret damage and tracking, and then top it all off with 7.5% bonus to your armor repair amount. So this thing is tanky, it does a lot of damage, and it tracks really freaking well. It's essentially yeah. a mini Plus one gun. gun. Yeah. yeah, plus one gun too, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think actually almost might be too strong and we'll probably see a nerf soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to going and buying like 10 of those and just flying them through faction warfare plexes and getting fights, probably with other VNIs this weekend. Interesting. So is that, uh, I think we're up to present day on Fuedit. I know we were waiting, hoping that a particular guest could show up on time, but unfortunately it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. Do we want to talk about what what it does for Alliance income without them? I think I feel like we have to mention it now that I've brought up the topic of conversation. So what does Fuedit as an alliance do for income nowadays? So, um, Ixon, were you planning on bringing so, so Chainsaw I, I, or the other one? The Chainsaw. I tried, okay. to get, I tried to get our... He's on now, but we already talked about most of the earlier yeah. stuff. So, so to answer your question about money, and I'm going to tiptoe around this because I'm going to get yelled at by the guy who funds us if I uh, say a little bit too much. Um, but needless to say, what it income is handled by a very wealthy member or members in our alliance who earn ESC in non-traditional ways. Uh, it may not be above the table, if you know what I'm saying. Um, but no, we just... Look, you can do a lot of market trading and a lot of contract looking. Like there are many ways to make money without needing SOV. And um, as Aerith will tell you and many other groups will tell you, um, the biggest way to make money isn't actually having SOV ratting and mining. It's actually a lot of passive ISK. Because passive ISK, you can move a lot of uh, passive, uh, sorry, ISK making. You can move a lot of ISK easily because you don't have to do anything. You just kind of sit there. So, you know, those people that... Uh, trade in perimeter or trade in Jitta or and then move stuff back and forth. There's a lot of money to be made there because all you do is just sit there and just make buy orders. So it's not yeah, that, but like, I, that's I, scary. I do want to amend what I say because I realize I made it sound like RMT. It's not RMT. I swear to God, it's not RMT. <laughs> No, it's just there are many ways to make ISK without SOV. We keep a bit of SOV to uh, look in, uh, to kind of 
allow people who do really want to do that well it used to be b and i ratting to do that but um the, you know the, there's a um i suggest passive is making for anyone that really needs isk or to ask me i mean much. hang on a second so like station trading moving stuff from amar to jita all of that is perfectly above board passive isk making industry yeah, is perfectly that's why above I don't board know why it so scary. exxon what do you mean by not necessarily above board if it's not rmt come on now okay i people have mentioned it in chat so i'm just gonna say it uh, scamming is a thing that you can make a lot of money in this game with if you know how to do it. And I'm just yeah. gonna leave it at that. Like, try is doubling. Just try is doubling. I, I just just go to Jitta, set up your bio, and try is doubling. You will be yeah. surprised how much money you can. People still fall for that. Really? Who would be well, so that, that one, Yeah, people still fall for stuff like that. But um, in my opinion, like you know, well, renter empires are really common these days. Moon renting is really common these days. Uh, personally, I think you can probably make more money doing cable stuff or cable. Cable. Aerith does where you just kind of try and anticipate what people need and want. And it's so much more easier than having to manage something essentially physical, right? Your Athenor can die, your Athenor can blow up, but say you know when the next Ferox op is going to be and you just buy into that and then sell it when it ends. Um, if you lose out, all you guys are a bunch of Ferox holes sitting around, you don't really lose too much out of that. So um, there's definitely better ways to make money than this kind of traditional um, infrastructure that a lot of other groups have. Yeah, we'll put it this way. If we told you how much we can make doing these kind of things, you would not believe us in the slightest. No, I mean, Aerith has quoted this before. And in this podcast, well, not this specific one, in previous ones that I've listened to. And he's definitely true. There's a lot of money to be made, either doing speculations or just essentially helping people out by stocking stuff. Um, you know, say you need a Sino in some random backward system and you decide to pay a little bit extra for it. That happens on a daily occurrence. Um, and you're going to make a lot of money doing that. All right, fair enough. Some interesting, if not good or bad, advice on income in EVE Online. Let's let's transition things. I feel like we've wrapped up the Fuedit store. We've got the good narrative of where you guys came from, the path you took to achieve where you are right now, and what you currently do. Uh, we did this again. I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but if you are a supporter of talking in stations in some financial or pseudo financial way, so if you like. Uh, our Discord Nitro Booster, or a Twitch subscriber, or you support us on Patreon, you get a special channel on our Discord. And in that channel, if you check the pinned messages, there's a form you can fill out and give suggestions for show topics or things like that. And we actually had a, a number of people ask for history or corp spotlight type shows. And so this is one of a series of them that we're going to start doing just like little history, get a, give us the narrative of these many storied groups that we have in EVE Online. So thank you very much, Niv and Exxon, and the other guy who was going to show up but unfortunately could not, for very good reasons, mind you, uh, for showing up and giving us that history. But we're going to jump into the news section here, and Ron is currently not here to kick us off, so Silver, can you give us the, the weekly update on the Southern War that nobody talks about but nonetheless happens? Yeah, I mean, there's been a couple of big fights uh, this week. Um, you're starting to see Legacy ramp up the pressure on Sav and Detorid. Um, even last night, uh, there were several systems that were RF'd. Um, you could see on that map there to the bottom left um, of that map, uh, all those systems up through there were RF'd. And we had a multi-app right in there. A multi-hour fight over those systems. Two hubs went down. Um, Legacy won the fight pretty well. Um, so you're starting to see the line push forward in a detoured now. Um, you're still not getting the big glamorous capital fights, but it's, um, it's fierce subcap warfare. Uh, most of these fights go on for a few hours. A lot of them are in the, well, most of them are in the AU time zone. Um, but because the ADMs are starting to widen out, you're starting to see fights bleed into the late US time zone now, um, and early EU time zone. So I think that's only bad for uh, fraternity to be honest um because now we're seeing very big numbers from legacy because the u.s time zone guys are staying up late you, you time zone guys are getting up early um so yeah definitely movement going on there yeah i also noticed you guys had a big fight that wasn't related to the war necessarily but just blackout in general uh, where uh i forget there was a fantastic joke 
that I read somewhere, but I forget what it was. So we're going to move on from there and just say that basically everybody else in EVE decided to come and shoot at your Rorquals. Yep, pretty much. Um, that's going to happen. I think that Blackout breeds that sort of thing, right? Um, plus they know that uh, Testin has a good response fleet. So um, I think that's healthy. I know Ron... Uh, Ron didn't really like it too much. He took it a little bit, you know, like, hey, why does everybody have to gang up on it? But um, it's good stuff, though. Good so content. there was a um, and there there was a Reddit post about someone saying, oh, I think a lot of it feels like a lot of frat or like Winter Coalition people are leaving. Does that feel like? Does it feel like to you? Does it feel like um, your yep. other side is straying a little? Yeah, few corporations moving on. Um, some of the smaller ones uh, looking for other things, um, like Vindictive. I think is moving up and out. Um, weekend warriors are moving up and out. A couple other uh, corporations in there. Yeah. Are those all the people who lived up in Scalding Pass? I, I remember the weekend warriors name from Scalding Pass. Yeah, if you put that map you just had up there, weekend warriors was in the Torrid, just just north of where we were fighting last night. Like oh, uh, I see. up, yeah, right there. I'm sure there is a, a side of the story from the Winter Coalition side related to why exactly those changes are taking place and how it affects their ability to continue to compete in this war. It's worth noting yeah, that... Yeah, I'd love to talk to them, for sure. It's worth noting that there has been some recent fighting up in Scalding Pass, or at least there was a few weeks ago. Do you have any updates on that? It certainly seems like things are extremely active up here, even though it's very far away from the border between legacy and winter coast space itself yeah it's a bit far but not when you talk about jump rangers you can get up there pretty quickly but you know that that's sort of a soft spot in the fraternity uh underbelly you know that's why we attacked up there a bit uh, adms are a bit lower the groups up there are a bit smaller you know, so it was sort of like a while we're pushing on the meat of their defense you know heading up there was yielding some success all right, well, we'll continue to keep our eye out on this war that is happening, but apparently people aren't talking about it enough for Legacy Coalition's preferences. In the meantime, there's some other news that occurred. So there was, we mentioned it a bit earlier on in the show, there was a massive dread bomb that failed. Uh, it was a dread bomb from Liberty Squad, which is a U.S. time zone SIG, special interest group within the Imperium, and they tried to dread bomb snuffed out. And it did not go well for them. Oof, yeah. Does anyone have any extra details, or can we just ogle at this battle report for a minute and then move on? Exxon was actually there. Oh, right. well, I was, ready, I was ready to jump in, but my Dread character was lagging a little bit behind, so I didn't get in on the, the first wave. But for your range chickens, I think we committed four or five Dreads to that, because, I mean, we can't, we can't turn down an opportunity to shoot snuff, and we especially can't turn down an opportunity to drop some Dreads. Um, but by the time my dread was ready to bridge in, unfortunately, uh, Snuff had already dropped all their Titans, and when Snuff drops their Titans, there's not a whole lot you can do against it. Yeah, I mean, this goes to... I, I see this sort of battle report um, with Snuff a lot, right? And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, Snuff had to know that that goon dread bomb was coming. There's no way they didn't. And it looks like, to me, I wasn't there, but it looks like they just took advantage of that intel. Baited a bit. Looks to me like I wasn't there, Exo, but it was like our draw the bait there. Like, let's bomb the our draw capitals, and then stuff came and cleaned up. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. So I, I, I wasn't, I didn't have a character on grid, so I'm not actually a hundred percent sure. Um, but as someone's pointing out in chat right now, I'm pretty sure the Vanquisher was bait. Yeah. Uh, I think that I heard that the Vanquisher got bumped pretty hard, and I think that's the the catalyst that Goose kind of yeah, uh, okay. jumped in on. Uh, they j jumped in on, and, and I'll give Snuff credit, they're pretty good at dropping just a couple of things, making you commit the real force, and then bringing in their hammer afterwards. And I think uh -huh. that was exactly what happened with this fight. Yeah, yeah so the, the subcap... really good at that. The, the subcap fight was solid, but then, um, you know, uh, you can't ever out-escalate, so... Yeah, there was a BR posted by, I believe they claimed to be a member of the Liberty Squad itself, or at least they were fighting on yeah, that side. Yeah, they mean as their main leadership. And they, they say that they thought that they could break the Vanquisher, but it turns out they couldn't. And so they just wasted a lot of time because it is very much a DPS race in these Dread Bomb situations. You have to kill them before they kill you because you're just constantly losing Dreads. 
that they wasted too much time shooting a vanquisher and so it didn't quite make the isk positive math happen there. Yeah, but I'm definitely glad that they, they at least made an attempt, which I think not a lot of groups can even say these days. I feel like there's a didn't want that dread fleet anyway joke in here somewhere. Yeah, oh, hashtag no. already replaced. <laughs> some, some capital producer somewhere is very happy. All right, the, the final little bit of news we have, actually it came from just before the show, which is a thing that I heard somewhere in a, in a back channel on Discord, which is that Hard Knocks is doing stuff. They're back in wormhole space, so they were evicted from, where, from Rage, and people were saying, oh, are they going to disband? Are they going to stay together? There was a bunch of Reddit drama saying HK is literally taking a vote about whether they're going to disband or whether they're going to stick together and do something else. And I know they were bopping around in C2 space. They were doing the C2 Nullsec static thing to just roam around in Nullsec. But reportedly they have moved back into Rage. That happened a little bit ago. And now they have started seeding other farm holes is what they're called. So they're basically wormholes that are only used for PvE. They're not where PvP corporations base out of and will fight you for normally. They're just where they log in once or twice a week and do a bit of crabbing. And reportedly, Hard Knox is seeding a bunch of these with Fortizars of their own, either to try and take them over or just farm the farmers, so to speak. So it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens when that occurs. There's definitely a lot of speculation going around that Hard Knox is a main beneficiary of the death of Skillyu, apart from Winter Coalition. So it seems like the narrative is that anybody from Skillyu who really enjoyed the the null block null sec sovereignty warfare sort of stuff went over to winter coalition but then the side that enjoyed the wormhole side of sort of content also the super capital like we're going to drop on rorquals type content they're going back over towards hk and so hk is sort of gaining members gaining activity and seem to be making some moves in wormhole space we'll do our best to keep you updated on that but if you're particularly interested in the wormhole side of things definitely check out the whole story podcast made by CSM member Exuki. Alright, and anybody else, there was a thing that Matterall did on the Sunday show that we are totally going to steal now, and I did not prep our guests or even my co-host for it, which is that just give a give a tip for the EVE Online player. What is something that a listener may not know? Does anybody have thing, something that comes to mind? I do. I one. Okay, go ahead, Exxon. So to kind of to piggyback on some things we said earlier, but if you think uh, the only way to make ISK in this game is ratting or mining or exploration, I encourage you to try out some alternative methods, be it market work, watching contracts, uh, doing a little bit of ISK doubling, things like that. Uh, give it a couple of days, uh, especially if you're doing something like ISK scamming uh, or ISK doubling. Uh, maybe do give it like a week. See how you like it. See how much money you can make. And maybe never look back at ratting or mining. And do it on an alt, though. Don't do it oh, on yeah. your man. Good, good advice. Uh, oh, I got one that um, just happened to me recently. Um, in low sex, sex status matters. So as a, if you can shoot anyone on a gate or station of low enough sex status without getting gate guns. So essentially you can shoot them, um, but their friends can't shoot you back because they'll like, take gate guns. So it's a really great way of um, being able to kind of um, pick a group, pick someone out of a group to engage in a fight with them. Awesome. Silver, how about you? Gee, uh, I don't know if I have one, honestly. All right, um, well, fair enough. You could rat still in Nullsec without a VNI. Uh, it's called a Dominix. It's really good. It's a battleship, I'm told. Looks like a potato, if I recall correctly. It's kind of like a potato. All right, well, my my thing you might not know is actually sort of meta EVE. It's related to a tool that many EVE players use who multi-box. It's called EVO Preview. And I recently found out that if you go into the files that you download when you install the program, there's a PDF called README. And if you actually read it, it has instructions on how to set up hotkeys for your various EVE clients. This is something that a lot of players use, uh, what's it called? The multi-boxing program that I suddenly forget the name of. Somebody help me. Box. Yeah, a lot of people use IS Boxer because they can set hotkeys to activate their various accounts. You can do this with Evo Preview as well. 
but I didn't know it because there's no GUI for it. You actually have to go in and edit a JSON file, but it's super simple, super easy to set up, and it is incredibly powerful and really helps you out when you're multiboxing. So I would awesome. highly recommend if you're a multiboxer and you use Evo Preview, read the README PDF and set that up because it is an awesome feature. All right, well, that'll do it for Talking Stations Season 3, Episode 6. Hope you enjoyed. You can tune in. Definitely, you should tune in. 1600 UTC on Sunday. We're going to be premiering the interview with CCP Hillmore, CCP Goodfella, and CCP Falcon. It is fantastic. You do not want to miss it. And uh, we'll see you next week.